Good morning, church. I don't know if maybe you've gotten tired or gotten out of the habit of singing out with us on Sunday mornings at home. I know it's definitely a different season, but I encourage you this morning maybe to turn up the computer or the TV and sing out with us this morning. I know that singing helps these truths sink deep into us, and I know God loves to hear us sing. So let's sing about how and what Jesus has overcome through his death and resurrection. says that if we draw near to God, God will draw near to us. So I invite you as we sing this next song together to take an opportunity to draw near to our God, who is our healer and our savior, who fills our brokenness with his goodness and his grace.
We thank you for your grace that surrounds us and fills our broken places. That by the blood of your son, Jesus, that we have forgiveness of our sins. God, we thank you that there's nothing we can do to separate us from your love for us. We give you praise today and forevermore. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Hillside Church Online. I hope you're feeling welcomed and encouraged by the service so far. Although it would seem that some of you aren't encouraged enough to get out of bed, but hey, that's the beauty of doing this online thing. You can be nice and comfortable in your own home, no worries. That being said, we still wanna hear from you. You can say hey in the chat, we'll say hey back. And if you're new with us, we'd love for you to fill out a Connect card. All right, to connect, you can click the prompt that's in the chat right now, or there should be three little bars like this, somewhere's at the top of your screen. Click that, there'll be a drop-down menu. One of those items should say connect card. Click on that, it'll take you to a different window, but don't freak out, we'll still be right here. Fill the connect card out to get in touch with us or to sign up for future events. So speaking of upcoming events, our two big summer events are both taking place in August. So the first big event is our Kids Focus Virtual Experience. So starting on August 5th, every Wednesday in August, you're gonna be able to go to our Kids Online webpage and see what goofy things our Kids Leadership Team is up to. Honestly, I've been recording some of the content and it is hilarious. You're not gonna to wanna to miss it. So to sign up, you can go to hillsidemoncton.org slash kids online. Okay, so the second big event, August 6th and 7th, is the GLS. That's right, Hillside is once again hosting the Global Leadership Summit. To sign up, go to hillsidemoncton.org slash GLS. You'll see two registration links. Now, if you're a member of Hillside, make sure you click on that link. That way you can get the host church discount. But make sure you sign up before July 30th. Now, here's a sneak peek of this year's GLS. All right, guys, make sure you sign up for these two awesome opportunities coming in August. Remember, you can go to our website, hillsidemoncton.org, to register for both of these events. On behalf of Hillside, I want to thank each and every one of you that gives to Hillside. Thank you so much for financially partnering with us on our mission to glorify Christ in this world. If you'd like to continue giving or try giving, you can do so through the prompt in the chat, the drop down menu, or you can go to hillsidemoncton.org slash give. Would you please pray with me for the offerings? Father, I just thank you for every blessing that you give us. I thank you that you reign in our hearts, that you teach us your word through these services. Please continue to grow the influence and responsibility of Hillside in our region. Thank you for all those who give financially and please bless them according to your will. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, guys, that's all from me. I'm now gonna send you over to Roger and Bronwyn for a quick update. Happy Sunday, everybody.
Hey Brahman, how you doing? I'm doing well. I was just able to have a week of vacation with my family, which I really enjoyed. How about you? How's your summer going? Summer's been going great. Uh, working on a lot of stuff for HSM, but no vacation yet, but the landing bubble's opening up, so I'm hoping to get back home to visit dad. It'd be kind of nice. But Brahman, I understand that there are actual students working in the building this summer. Uh, you wanna tell us all about those? There are. We have five fantastic students here this summer. We have Alyssa Ching, who is working with Laura and Braxton. She is in her third year at Crandall doing wow. her degree, both English and biology. We have two students in SKA. We have Lane Bennett and Kayla Curtis. Kayla is doing her post-degree bachelor in social work in Fredericton, and she graduates next January, which is exciting. And Lane just graduated from high school, yeah. from Tremble, and she is gonna be going to Crandall in the fall to do a business degree. Now, we also have two more students. Wow. We have Emma Hayes, who is working with Kristen and Erica and I in kids ministry. She also just graduated from Tremble and is going to Crandall to do a degree in theology in the fall. And last but not least, we have Bethany McDonald, who just graduated from Crandall with her education degree, and she's gonna be teaching at Moncton Christian Academy in the fall. Wow, okay. That's five, yes. but they're not students anymore. Like these are young adults now. I mean, graduated high school, finishing up Crandall, in, in Crandall, it's it's so good. But we also have four students this summer actually working at camps. That's really exciting too. Yeah, so a lot of camps are not open this summer, but there are some camps that you know were able to pull things together and open. And so some of our students stepped up and said, yeah, we'll come and we'll pretty much give up our summer mm -hmm. and work with you. And so we have uh, Jerome Co, right? And his brother, Daniel. Uh, we also have David O working there uh, for the first time. And also uh, this kid named Nathan Reed is also working at camp. And uh, yeah, they're really looking forward to it. That's really great. I never had the opportunity to work at camp, but I know it's a great experience for them. Absolutely. And part of our hillside culture here is that we like to support mm -hmm. our kids going to camp because we know that they give up a lot of summer, mm -hmm. okay, for very little money. And so we have this program, what do we call it? We call it Raise a Wage. And we are actually able to still participate in that this year. Absolutely. And if you go to our giving tab, there is an option to give to summer students. And so that is how you can go on and sponsor these students this right. summer. Yeah, and that's for the camp kids? Yes, for the kids that are working at camp. Awesome, really good, because I know they would really appreciate any little thing that we, as a church, can do to support our kids and uh, you know they do a lot for us so you know what why don't we just take a moment and why don't we just pray for the summer students working here right a uh, whole new reality and also the kids are working at camp again a whole new reality uh, so let's go ahead and let's just pray for them right hey God thank you so very much uh, for the students that uh, are just giving up their summers to uh, give back to their church uh, God we thank you so much that you know, we're able to do this and be able to employ them and just to give them some really good learning opportunities. God, we also pray for, uh, you know, the guys that are working at camp this summer. Uh, we just pray that you would continue to strengthen them, empower them. Uh, you know, 24 seven, they're gonna be working uh, with kids uh, that they, they, they don't know in environments that they are not quite sure of, the whole new realities. So God, we just pray that you will help them as well to live you out loud and to share your gospel. But Lord, right now, uh, we're so thankful for uh, Hillside, we're thankful for our church, and uh, we're just uh, looking forward to the message that's going to be brought to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, hey there, Hillside family. It's great to join together again online for our service today. We're kind of in the summer now, and it's great to stay connected. And if you're joining us for the first time, we're really glad you're here today as well. We're in the summer series from the Gospel of Mark. And you know, when I think about the summer, it really is a season of replenishment where we enjoy getting outdoors a little bit more, and hopefully that we get our buckets filled to be you know, replenished. In fact, I, I have this bucket that uh, I actually have had on my bookcase in my office for the last number of months, and it's just kind of a symbolic reminder reminder to me about the importance of making sure that my bucket is filled because sometimes buckets can get really emptied in the midst of the stress of life but God wants us to be restoring and replenishing those buckets and the reality is in the summertime you know there's outdoor activities there's enjoying the sunshine more and things like kayaking and hiking and golfing those are you know some things probably you enjoy and I enjoy uh, as well and uh, being you know being around family and friends is a wonderfully replenishing thing attending the global leadership summit I look forward to that every year and a number of hillsiders and people in our region for the last number of years. It's a way to really kind of fill your bucket as well. Um, but you know, the greatest way that we can have our buckets filled in the summertime is to make sure we also spend some time with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, some of you know that for me, um, in addition to outdoor activities and the summit and different things in the summer, I also have a summer reading list. Every year I strategically have a number of books, usually eight or nine books that are on my list and that I really really look forward to reading, um, you know, during the summer months for some replenishment, but by far the greatest book for us to read and spend time in is the story of God revealed to us in, through Jesus, and this summer it's in the Gospel of Mark, and so if you read, you know, basically a chapter or two a week, you'll be able to get through the 16 chapters of Mark by the end of the summer and continue to join with us every Sunday. We'll, one of our pastors will be serving up a message uh, from the Gospels as we journey together, and then on Wednesdays we have a weekly Wednesday video that's another devotional, again, to encourage us to be in, into the word of God because, you know, Jesus said that mankind shouldn't just live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so Jesus is the word, the living word, and we really want to get to know him better. And so as you get into the gospels, just pray. Say, Lord, Jesus, would you reveal your heart to me? Would, would you help me get to know you better? And you know, as a church, we want to be a place where people can find and then begin to follow follow Jesus in a life-changing relationship with him. Well, we started Mark's gospel last week. I just want to kind of pick up where I left off there, where it says in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, it says, and so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, that John was sort of the forerunner, that Jesus was, was such an extraordinary person that he needed somebody to introduce him, to get people ready for the coming of the Messiah. So John John was chosen by God to preach a strong message of repentance and for people uh, to be baptized, uh, you know, to express their desire to really, you know, have a spirit of contrition, to really be made right with God. And then it goes on and John says this, that this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. You know, that John began to have a lot of crowds and a lot of people who were following him, but he, with a real posture of humility, he said, listen, it's not about me. I'm just a servant. I'm just subservient to the purpose of God that one is coming, Jesus, he's the Messiah. He's the king. He's bringing in a new kingdom, and he is far more significant than I am. I'm not even worthy to, you know, tie the sandals uh, you know, the, uh, the throngs on his sandals because of who he really is. And, and so then, though in the midst of all that, Jesus actually gets baptized by John. And it wasn't because Jesus had sin to, you know, repent of in his life, but rather as the sinless Savior, he came to identify with us in our sinfulness, that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteous of God. And so he's identifying with us through his baptism. And also, all of heaven is watching what is taking place here. And when Jesus was baptized by John, it's sort of be the beginning of Jesus. Jesus' public ministry, that he lived a very quiet life in seclusion in Nazareth, but all of a sudden, he's about to launch the kingdom. The time has come, this, this uh, kairos moment in Jesus' life, and, and, and the Lord God, the Father in heaven says, this is my son whom I love and in whom I am well pleased, and it's sort of the launch of Jesus' ministry, kind of like his commissioning uh, into launching the kingdom of God, and earlier in our service today, you heard about some summer students. We're praying for them. We're kind of commissioning them, sending them out to, to our ministry with our church here at Hillside this summer. 
And some of the students we're supporting in our prayers and through our financial generosity who are working at camp this summer and, and the idea of being commissioned. And I remember, you know, several years ago, actually over 30 years ago now, uh, when I had my ordination service, when I publicly began, you know, ministry, and I was at Main Street Baptist Church in the old North End, and it was a really momentous night and a lot of family and friends and people were there and, and, and I was set apart. And at the end of the service, when I was commissioned for ministry, I just said, a few words to everybody who was there thanking them for their support and then I said you know a ship in a harbor is safe but that's not what a ship was made for a ship was designed to be out on the sea on rescue missions and and being light in the midst of the chaos and darkness and 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 that's what we're called to because that's the example Jesus gave us that he came to rescue and to save and to redeem and to be out in the midst of the sea of humanity with all of their brokenness and to heal them and to make a difference and so Mark launches us now into the ministry and there's like one miracle one exorcism uh, one incredible teaching moment that literally wherever Jesus went there were crowds of people because he taught with authority and because he healed them he was like the great physician did you know that in Jesus day the average lifespan was probably somewhere in the mid 30s uh, that you know the quality of life uh, you know sanitation health issues a lot of those things were such um, you know that people didn't have good you know health care and so Jesus came along with power to heal and he was like the great physician and there were crowds around him everywhere and um, and here's what it says uh, you know revealing Jesus all these signs and wonders and people were just astonished when they, when they saw and they heard Jesus. So look what it says here in your notes in Mark 1 and verse 27 and 28 it says the people were so amazed they asked each other who is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region so there's teaching and there's exorcisms and all these things that Jesus is doing because he's the king and he's initiating this new kingdom into the world. And, and by the way, the, the kingdom is not based on, you know, the love of power, but it's about the power of love, the power of compassion, and ultimately, by laying down his life as a ransom for many on the cross, that he initiates this restorative process in a broken world. And then it goes on in Mark 2, here's another miracle. It said, he said to who? To the paralytic, this guy who was un unable to walk. Jesus said, I tell you to, you know, take up your mat and go home. He, he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this before. We've never seen someone heal people like what Jesus is doing. And in the story here, there's a crowd of people. There's so many, they couldn't even fit into the house. Uh, there were so many, and so they, four friends, of this guy, the paralytic, had to cut a hole in the roof of the house to let him down so that Jesus could heal him. And then as you go on, remember, we're trying to read a chapter or two a week in Mark, so this is week two in our sermon series, so you should be up to like chapter three or four. It goes on, there's more miracles, more uh, exorcisms of, of demons and, and dealing with spiritual oppression, and then Jesus gives some parables, helping people understand what the kingdom of God is all about. And then at the end of chapter four, there's this remarkable story where Jesus stills this raging storm, this fierce storm in the Sea of Galilee, and the response of the disciples are in chapter chapter 4 and verse 41, it says, they said, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him, that they were just blown away by who Jesus was. And, and, and then Mark continues on and goes from one story, one sign, and wonder after another. Remember, he's racing through the book because Mark is kind of an extended introduction and his focus is on the last week of the life of Jesus. So chapters 10 through 16, basically 40% of the gospel is focused on the last week of Jesus because that's why he actually came as the suffering servant. And look what it says in Mark 15, 39, at the death of Jesus with all of the atmospheric phenomena that took place the moment Jesus died. And it says the centurion, this Roman soldier, saw how he died and he said, surely this man was the son of God. And of course, soon after is the greatest miracle of all, which is the miracle of the resurrection that further, you know, just validated who Jesus really was. Now, before we dive into the story of the stilling of the storm today, I want to just kind of uh, uh, share with you about why miracles are so important. What is the purpose of miracles in the biography of Jesus? When you look at Mark's gospel and then you, you, you glean all of the uh, stories of miracles in the four gospels, there's 35 miracles recorded in the gospel. Some of them are miracles over nature where, you know, Jesus was at a wedding. Man, if you ever have a wedding, make sure Jesus is there because if you 
you run out of wine, no problem. He'll turn the water into wine. And Jesus fed the 5,000 in the wilderness. They didn't have to worry about McDonald's or some other takeout because Jesus was there and he provided more than enough food for everyone to eat. And he walked on water and he stilled the storm. So there's a lot of miracles over nature, but then there's also healings. People like the paralytic, people who are born blind, uh, you know, cleanse the leper um, of their illness. And so what is the purpose of these miracles? Two things. Number one, miracles give us a snapshot of how things should be and someday they will be. It's interesting that Jesus didn't heal everybody in his time because that wasn't his purpose. His purpose, well, he certainly was moved with compassion to people and, and, and he often healed them, but he didn't heal everybody. Why? Because that wasn't ultimately the main reason he came. He, the main reason he came was to give his life as a ransom for us and to release us from the brokenness and oppression of the world. But he did heal some. And those healings were a snapshot of the way life was meant to be prior to the fall, prior to Genesis chapter three, you know, back in the Garden of Eden, the way things were meant to be and the way someday they will be when Jesus comes at a second coming and he ushers in a new heaven and new earth and, and, and restores all things and our, our broken bodies and our broken minds and our broken hearts are all made completely whole because of Jesus' redemptive work. But then secondly, the second reason for miracles is to powerfully reveal his deity as the son of God. That, that you know, that, that, and here I want you to catch this in your notes. The point here is that Jesus does only what God can do. Only God can forgive sins. Only God can receive worship. Only God can, uh, you know, come back from the dead like Jesus said, you know, that he would come back on the third day. Only God could do some of the kinds of miracles that Jesus demonstrated and they, they're signs uh, uh, indicating, validating that Jesus really is the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords, that there's a lot of kings in the world, but Jesus is the king of kings. He's the greatest king ever. There are a lot of lords, but he's the Lord of lords and there's nobody who is like Jesus. And I love what John Ortberg says, a, a brilliant writer in his book about really grappling with, you know, thinking about, well, who is Jesus? And he says these words, we need to stop arguing about Christianity. Instead, we need to marvel at Jesus. And then he says this, 2,000 years ago, who would guess who would have more impact? Think about this, Jesus, would you pick Jesus or the Roman Empire? I mean, come on, would you pick a penniless carpenter from a backwater village called Nazareth who never had an army, never ran for political office, never wrote a book, never traveled geographically beyond the borders of ancient Israel? Would you choose him to have the greatest impact? Or would you choose the Roman Empire with all of their power, with all of their armies, Nero and Caesar and all of those people who, you know, who lived during that era? And Ortberg says the real question is not who was this man, but who is this man? Who is this Jesus that, that, that caused people to be so astonished and so filled with wonder and with a sense of awe? Who was he? other than the fact that he was the divine son of God and, and, and that Jesus' legacy continues to be felt in our world some 2,000 years later. You know, we sometimes talk about the good Samaritan or we talk about, you know, make sure you live according to, uh, you know, to the golden rule. Well, we say that in, in our sort of our, our culture today. Where did those teachings come from? They came from the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth. And, and you know, you look around, last year I had the opportunity to uh, visit the city of San Francisco for the first time. It was a wonderful trip. But did you know that there's a city called San Francisco, it was named after someone because several hundred years ago, there was a man named Francis of Assisi. He lived in Italy and he was so transformed by the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth that he went out to serve the poor. And because of that, there's a city uh, named after him in San, called San Francisco today. And then on that same trip, I went to another city called Sacramento. And you know why there's a city called Sacramento? It's because 2,000 years ago, the most unique person who ever lived gathered his disciples together in the upper room before he died on the cross, and he had a sacred meal. And he said that this bread and this cup, they're, 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 they're reminders to you of the sacrament of, of my presence with you and reminder of what I have done sacrificially for you. 
And we think about cities and places around the world like San Juan and San Jose and, and St. Paul and St. Petersburg and, and, and San Paulo and all of these different places that are named because there was a man named Paul and there's a man named John and Joseph and others down through the ages who believed that Jesus was the Son of God and many of them gave their lives as martyrs and their legacy lives on. The fingerprint of Jesus is seen 2,000 years later in the world around us. And that's why, you know, even the city of Toronto, you ever know, you want to know, you ever want to know why there's a place called Toronto? Yeah, I'm not sure either. I don't know if anybody knows. Even Jesus might not know. I'm not sure. No, I'm not just kidding. But, uh, but Jesus' impact is seen in the world around us. And so today we're looking at this story. We talk about miracles of Jesus stilling the storm. Have you ever gone through a storm? Maybe, uh, you know, there's, there's physical storms we go through and then sometimes there's uh, maybe more, uh, you know, symbolic or metaphorical kind of storms we go through trials in our life. Um, but we think about thunderstorms in recent years. There have been tsunamis. There have been hurricanes. I think about Katrina that caused like over a billion dollars damage in and around the New Orleans area and other places. Uh, and, 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 you know, there have been, you know, tornadoes and, and windstorms and power outages. And, you know, this is summer season. I love to go golfing. And I remember a number of years ago, I actually got to attend a PGA tournament down uh, at a golf course called the Doral down in the Miami area. And I was just so excited. My son Ryan was with me and just loved this incredible day. We were, we were following some of the greatest golfers in the world. It was just, you know, a ton of fun and having a great day. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there was this severe weather warning that was announced and, the, and the, 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 the horn went off in the golf course. I never saw so many people head to the clubhouse and head to their cars uh, as quickly as they did. Why? Because people who live in southern Florida know that sometimes just, you know, just really quickly and unexpectedly, weather can change really dramatically. And, and there was a fear of thunder and lightning. It was a, it was a you know, potentially life-threatening situation. In fact, they literally shut down the tournament and, and Nobody was able to golf again the rest of that particular afternoon. It's kind of a bummer uh, for us, but it's just a reminder that sometimes there are storms. Well, this storm that happened, and it's recorded in Mark chapter 4, if you have your Bibles or smartphone, was a storm that came really quickly, almost like unexpectedly, and it became a life-threatening situation a crisis um, for the disciples. And I think it's very relevant for us because we all go through times of crisis and challenge in our lives as well. In fact, our world is living in a crisis right now. Isn't that true? It's called COVID-19. We have this global health crisis. I mean, it's unprecedented. We've never lived through something like this before, at least not in our lifetime. And then there's been like one series of crises after another. We went from, you went from COVID-19 into an economic crisis, and some of you are still feeling, you know, the impact of that at your work or maybe employment, some of your investments. And then went from that into a mental health crisis where there's a real concern about the emotional and mental well-being of people. Why? Because we were created for community. We weren't created to stay socially distanced from people. We were created to be in healthy relationships. And then, of course, more recently, there's been this race crisis that really has caused a real upheaval in our world. And so in a world where there are storms, how do we navigate these storms? Well, let's turn to the story here of Jesus in Mark chapter 4. And here's what it says. Begin reading in verse 35. It says that that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Now that day, meaning that it's now the evening hour, Jesus had literally been pouring out his heart. He had been teaching. He stood up on a boat because there was no sound system. He kind of like, and so he had to, you know, make sure people could hear him. There were throngs of people and he, and he was just spent. He had been teaching all day and we're reminded here um, of the humanity of Jesus, that, that Jesus needed sleep. He needed rest, that he was fully human and fully God, two natures perfectly conjoined together. He was the most extraordinary person ever. And so he said, you know, let's go to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern. The stern is the back of the boat, sleeping on a cushion. This is typically where the guest of honor might go. It's sort of the most comfortable place, safe place in the boat. Jesus was just exhausted. So he literally was sound asleep in the midst of this furious storm. Um, and it says, uh, it goes on to say, the disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. 
And then the wind died down and was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Now there are three things I want to draw your attention to in terms of navigating the storms. Number one is that storms can come even when you're doing the will of God. Do you realize that? That storms can come into your life even when you're doing the will of God. Like here are the disciples, literally, they're hanging out with Jesus and you know, doing everything right. In fact, Jesus said, let's get in the boat. They were following his instruction. Jesus was the one who said, let's get in the boat and let's cross over. They were on the Jewish side of the Sea of Galilee and Jesus wanted to go over to the Gentile side because he was reaching out both to Jews and to Gentiles and it was in the midst of doing the will of God that they came into this storm. Now, I have a map of the Sea of Galilee. I want to draw your attention to the whole northern region of Israel is called Galilee. You'll notice that Jesus was from a little town called Nazareth. It's located on the map there. It's sort of the southwest uh, corner of, uh, of the, the uh, Sea of Galilee. And you'll notice that the, you have the Sea of Galilee there. A lot of things happen in and around the Sermon on the Mount Jesus gave on the banks of the Sea of Galilee. There are a lot of significant things that happen in the Gospels. In fact, it's on my bucket list, man, just reading the Gospels again and getting into this map. I just said I'd love to get to Israel someday, love to visit the Sea of Galilee. You know, it's on my bucket list. Won't happen this year, but actually Grand Manan is on my bucket list and it looks like I'm going to get there this summer. So I'm looking forward to that and I'm sure we all have some bucket lists, but going and, you know, walking where Jesus walked would be pretty amazing. And the Sea of Galilee is often there's other, it's sometimes referred to as uh, Lake Tiberias. It's also known today as Lake Kinneret. That's a Hebrew word for violin. And if you look closely at the map, you'll see that the Sea of Galilee is actually in the shape of a violin. And so it's also called by that Hebrew name. And, um, uh, it is nine miles wide at its widest point, um, or, you know, around 15 kilometers wide, and it's about 13 miles long, or about 21 kilometers long, and it's the largest freshwater lake uh, within Israel. And what you need to catch is that um, it's actually located, it's actually in a basin, kind of like a bowl, um, and it's about 7,000 feet below sea level, if you can imagine, or about 2,100 meters. However, it's surrounded by mountains, and the largest mountain called Mount Hermon is about 2,800 meters above sea level. And so it creates a really interesting uh, weather uh, pattern sometimes because the cold air from the mountains come down, mixes with the warmer air uh, down uh, at the water level, and it can create sometimes instantly some really incredible storms, waves that can just rage, maybe, you know, 10-foot waves or more. And, and, well, in this particular story, it says here in Mark's Gospel, it was a furious squall. And the word furious in the Greek, it, it, it's the word megalot. We get our word mega. It was a mega storm. It was a ferocious storm. And what we need to remember then is three things um, as we think about this. Number one, Christians are not exempt from storms. That, that, you know, you, that you may be a follower of Jesus Christ, but that, that doesn't guarantee you that you're not going to have storms. That you might not, you know, that you might lose your job as you go through uh, COVID-19 or that you might, you know, get infected by COVID-19 or deal with illness or deal with any kind of struggle in life. In fact, Jesus said that in the world you will have struggles and disappointments, but, but have courage. Don't give up. Don't despair because I have overcome the world. Secondly, is that storms are not incompatible with God's goodness. I mean, isn't it true that whenever we go through a storm that sort of our default is we tend to just complain and say, oh God, you know, don't you care? And here the disciples are crying out. I mean, they, many of them are experienced fishermen and yet they've never experienced a storm that is so big as this particular, they, they literally thought they were gonna die. You need to think they, they were panic stricken. They thought this was it. They couldn't, you know, they had their buckets but they couldn't, you know, get the water out of the boat quick enough as, as they were, you know, being submerged with water and the winds were, were, you know, reaping all of that kind of havoc. And they said, teacher, don't you care? We're, we're going to perish. And here you are asleep in the boat. And sometimes maybe we cry out to God. We said, Lord, don't you care? My life is a mess. Don't you care? God, I hate my job. I hate going to work every day. Don't you care? God, my, my, my child is sick or my child is struggling. God, don't you care? And when the reality is that, yes, God does care. And he actually is closer to us than we realize. And for the disciples, he was just a few feet away in the very same boat that they were in and, and he was there 
But then the third thing you need to realize is that some storms are actually a form of spiritual attack. And there are some real cosmic overtones to many of the stories in the Gospel of Mark, and I believe this is one of them, because it's interesting that Jesus, it says, when the disciples woke him up, it said that Jesus rebuked the storm, and the word rebuked is the same word that Mark used in chapter one, when it said that Jesus was in the synagogue, and he, re and he rebuked a man with an evil spirit. And in the ancient world, particularly um, for the Jews, and you see this in the Old Testament in the book of Job and, and, and some of the Psalms, uh, there was this sense with some ancient Near Eastern people that the seas were, uh, were, were evil. They were a, a sign of, of, of chaos and, and they were controlled uh, by the kingdom of darkness. And there was a lot of fear, a lot of paranoia um, with, with water and with oceans and with lakes. And... Um, and, and I believe that, th that this was almost like a demonic storm. This was almost like a satanic storm that was just raging. And you know, the Bible makes it very, very clear that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that, that, you know, that we're in the middle of a war. Uh, you know, between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, and the enemy is not excited to see the kingdom of God, of the light of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the goodness of Jesus, to penetrate our broken world. And, and, and he will sometimes send storms our way. And, and he wants to devour us and, and to thwart the purposes of God. And I believe that we see this, this conflict of good and evil being unleashed against Jesus and against, against the disciples here. And Jesus said he rebuked the storm, this sort of, almost like this demonic storm. And uh, you know, recently I had someone reach out to me and say, to me, I think I'm being oppressed. Uh, can you pray for me? I'm having trouble sleeping at night and I, I just feel like there's some oppression, some real darkness that is happening. And I just reminded this person that, you know, spiritual attack is real. I also reminded them that Jesus, you know, the Bible says greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So we don't have to be afeard of the enemy. In fact, the enemy, you know, runs at the name of Jesus. And so the authority of the name of Jesus. And I encourage this person to read Ephesians 6 and to read uh, Neil Anderson's book, The Bondage Breaker, and to realize that we have power over the kingdom of darkness. And that's something that I believe that is going on here in the text. In, in Psalm 89, in verse 8 and 9, it says, Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. And we see glimpses in the Psalms of where there's this, this, this sense in the ancient world that even monsters came out of the chaos and the evil of the seas and many were afraid of water. But God is sovereign and we see here that Jesus can do what only God can do in that he stills the storm. So number one, you need to realize that just because you're a believer doesn't mean uh, you know, and you could be doing God's will, but there could be storms come into your life. Number two is that nothing takes God by surprise um, or no, and, and can ever thwart his purposes. In Proverbs 19, 21, it says, we humans keep brainstorming options and plans, but his purpose prevails. Listen, I'm here to tell you that, that COVID-19 did not take God by surprise and that God is able to redeem and work through even the most troubling situation. And that's why despair is never an option. You might be in a raging storm, but God is greater and bigger than that storm. You say, how do you know, Pastor? Because the single greatest aspect of evil in the world was when Jesus died on the cross. And yet God overcame that and nothing can toward his purposes and Jesus rose from the grave. And so what's interesting in the story is the disciples are panic-stricken and they're worried and they feel like they're perishing and yet meanwhile Jesus is asleep on the boat. Can you imagine that? Like sleeping through a storm? And the question is how can Jesus sleep when everyone else is panicking? And the answer is that he knew everything was under control. That ultimately that Jesus is a picture of resting in the sovereign care of his Father who is in heaven. And he knows that ultimately everything is in God's care. And I don't know what might be keeping you awake at night these days, but I want you to know that God is bigger and greater than any storm that you might be going through and that you can rest in his sovereignty. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who is known as the Prince of Preachers in the 19th century, pastored a really influential church in London, and he said that the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which the believer rests his or her head at night, providing perfect peace. At the end of the day, that we realize that we are not God, that there are things beyond our control, but nothing is beyond the control of our sovereign, all-powerful God. And so we can entrust our situation into his care. 
And that's why, you know, the Apostle Peter said, you know, give all your worries and cares to God. Why? Because he cares about you. He really does. He may seem aloof or indifferent at times, but he's right there in the boat with you, closer than you can ever imagine. And he cares about you. He cares about, that's why we pray. You know, God cares about our prayers because he cares about us. That's his disposition. That's his heart. You want to know what God is like? Look into the face of Jesus. And you see a picture of compassion, a picture of goodness, a picture of mercy and love. And so, you know, believers, we've been doing God's will and and sometimes we can have storms come our way. We need to realize that nothing takes God by surprise. And then thirdly, we need to realize, and we need to catch this in the story, is that our greatest need is for a greater revelation of Jesus' greatness and his glory. That really what's going on in this story is the contrast between fear and faith. And that Jesus is using this storm as yet another opportunity to reveal his greatness and his uniqueness to the disciples. You see, Jesus wants to grow their faith. And this is, they, they finally, they get an epiphany that when Jesus stilled this storm, they realized once again who he really was. And he said, you know, peace be still. And the word still there is the word muzzle, that he literally muzzled the storm. Sometimes there's an animal who might be out of control and it needs to be muzzled. Well, Jesus powerfully muzzled this storm and, and stilled it. It was an incredible miracle. And what was the response? I love how the message renders verse 41. It says they were in absolute awe, staggered. Who is this anyway? They asked, wind and sea or at his beck and call, that they literally were, were terrified. They couldn't imagine that Jesus could do this. And the terrified here is a sense of awe, of wonder. Like, you know, whenever you're in the presence of God, sometimes we see this in the scriptures, and people are just overcome with the holiness of God, with the greatness of God, the glory of God. And, and the disciples, again, they, they just had to step back for a minute and said, whoa, this Jesus He's King Jesus. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. And you know, there's another story, a boat story in the Gospels, and it's when Jesus walked on the water. And in a corresponding Gospel in Matthew chapter 14, it's, here's what it says at the end of this miracle, that when they, the, when, when they, Jesus and Peter, climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped, and then the disciples, what did they do? They worshiped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. Again, they had another sort of transcendent moment where the light went on and their faith got stronger and they realized that Jesus was worthy of their worship because he is the the divine son of God and he is worthy of our worship today in the 21st century as well. I want to close out this message with the words of N.T. Wright, a brilliant New Testament scholar from England. And I want you to just listen to these words for a minute. Let them sink into your heart. Imagine this, this story in Mark today, as a blockbuster movie. It would need a big screen to do it justice. But make it your story. In other words, enter into the story, the drama of Jesus' life here. Actually, if you sign on with Jesus for the kingdom of God, it will become your story, whether you realize it or not, whether you like it or not, winds and storms will come your way. Mark's readers probably knew that better than most. They would have identified with the frightened men in the boat. Now, who is any right talking about? Because remember, Mark wrote the gospel to the Romans in the mid-60s in the midst of Nero's persecution. They had seen Peter and Paul persecuted and put to death. They had seen many Christians blamed for the fire in Rome and thrown to the wild animals in the Roman Colosseum. They had seen all of that. It was a time to fear, but yet Mark is saying, no, that in the midst of the storm of persecution and attack, that you can have faith in Jesus because he has overcome. And then, N.T. Wright says this, that's Mark's invitation to all of us. Okay, go on, wake up, Jesus. Pray to him in your fear and anger and don't be surprised when he turns to you as the storm subsides in the background and asks you when you're going to get some real faith as well. And I believe he's asking us that same question today that, you know, really the question is not, Lord, do you care about us? But really we need to, we need to focus on God's question. That is, why are you so afraid? Why isn't your faith stronger? And I believe that when we get a greater glimpse of who Jesus is in the midst of the storms of our life and we spend time walking with him through the gospel of Mark this summer that it'll deepen our faith as we come to find and follow Jesus. And that is our prayer for all of us as we journey together. 
And you know, as the pastor, one of the pastors here at Hillside with COVID-19, people are wondering, you know, when are we gonna have church again? And, and what's the future of the church gonna look like? And the reality is that none of us really know, right? There's a sense of uncertainty. We don't know, we just know the future is gonna be different than what it is now. There's no, you know, sort of the new normal will be different. But I do know this one thing. COVID-19 did not take God by surprise. I do know that God is still on his throne. And I know that we can trust him, that we can choose a pathway of faith over fear in the midst of the storm. And I can know with confidence that he will lead us and that he's in the boat with us. He's closer to us than we can all think or imagine. And so let's put our hope and our faith in him. Let's just pray together. Lord, I thank you that in the midst of the storms that you are the source of peace, you are the source of our hope. And I pray, Lord, that whoever may be going through a storm today, Lord, that in the midst of the storm, that they would cry out to you, they would reach out to you to know that, Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that you can calm whatever storm comes our way. And we thank you, Lord, that there is coming a day when you ultimately will, will restore our broken world. We'll be free from every single storm. And we thank you we have that hope because of the resurrection. You, Jesus, you are the way maker. You are the miracle worker. You are the promise keeper. You are the light in the darkness. And that is who you are. We want to worship you as your people today. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
we declare who you are. You are our way maker, our miracle worker. God, we thank you that you've shown us who you are in the scriptures and in our individual lives as well. God, we thank you that you're still active and performing, performing miracles today. And that even if we can't see what you're doing, we trust that you are always working. And that he who began a good work in us will carry it to completion until the day of Christ. Jesus, we look to you. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. And we love you. Amen. Thank you for joining us for church this morning online. Hope you have a great week this week. Do you go in peace to love and serve the Lord? Thank you.